A man is standing in the train station after just being told he's not allowed to board a high-speed train. Standing opposite him is a woman with a gadget in her hand and something on the screen blinking red. She points to an image and he thinks, you have got to be kidding me, as he stares at a cute shih tzu dog over which there's a large red X. The guy almost falls over when he sees a picture of himself wearing pajamas in public. Again, it's marked with an X. Can you guess what he's done wrong? We doubt you can because it's not the kind of thing that would naturally spring to mind, certainly not in the western world. We'll explain this man's transgression soon, but for now let's just say he's been a bad boy and his citizen score is less than admirable. In China, Big Brother is always watching. If you want to rank your citizens, you have to keep an eye on them constantly. So first of all, let's see how China does that and compare it with the West. The study we found revealed that for China's 1.4 billion plus population, there were around 200 million CCTV cameras. That works out to just over 14 CCTV cameras for every 100 people. We should add that there are lots of similar studies about China's surveillance and they all report unique data. Another study says China has 540 million CCTV cameras, and that's quite a difference. From what we can see, the 200 million number is probably too low. If the 540 million figure is correct, that would be about 38 cameras for every 100 people. All the studies we found agree that China has the most surveilled cities on the planet, with the UK and the US also appearing in the top 10 lists of CCTV surveillance. Some studies suggest the US has anywhere from 47 to 70 million CCTV cameras, but the Bureau of Labor Statistics said the number is closer to 85 million for the 336 plus million people in the US. That would work out to be about 25 cameras for every 100 people. The UK is also very high, with about 7 million CCTV cameras for its 67 plus million people. That's close to 10 cameras for every 100 people. Although other sources say this number is way too low, while researchers can't seem to agree, many say in China, the US, and the UK, there is one camera for every three or four people. But in a world where it seems like there's a camera for every few people, isn't it fair to ask, who's watching the watchers? Well, we got a solution, and it comes from the sponsor of today's video, Private Internet Access, the world's most transparent VPN provider. Boasting over 30 million downloads, PIA truly stands for user privacy. It hides your IP address and keeps your digital life cloaked, shielding it from prying eyes, whether that's your ISP, network admins, or even the government. Using the internet without PIA is like showering in a room with no door. Everyone can hear your bad singing skills. PIA has also proven its no logs policy in court battles and with an external audit from none other than Deloitte, one of the biggest and most trusted accounting firms in the world. But PIA isn't just about protection, it's also about giving you freedom. Whether you're in Shanghai, London, or New York, it makes all major streaming services accessible, with its servers located in 84 countries and in every US state. Also, PIA VPN is one of the few VPNs that supports P2P file sharing, giving you even more access to content. PIA runs seamlessly across platforms – Windows, Mac OS, Android, Linux, iOS, and many others. With a single subscription, you can protect an unlimited number of devices simultaneously. But hold on, it gets even better. We have a special offer for our viewers. Just go to PIAVPN.com Geopolitico and get an 83% discount on private internet access. And if that didn't convince you yet, subscribing to private internet access is completely risk-free. They have a 30-day money-back guarantee, and if you ever need help, their 24-7 customer support is ready and waiting. So go try private internet access right now. After all, your privacy deserves no less. But as we were saying, while researchers can't seem to agree, many say in China, the US, and the UK, there is one camera for every three or four people. The saying that comes to mind is, it's what you do with it that counts. In the US, CCTV cameras are often used for policing and security, but not for invasive surveillance. In China, that's the standard. Chinese cameras are often hooked up to a high-tech surveillance system. What is also important is online surveillance, something we can get a good idea about from how many official data requests there are from law enforcement to tech companies. We know the numbers in the West, but unfortunately China doesn't share such data. When it comes to data reports from Google last year, the US was easily the highest in the world outside of China at over 72,000 in the first half of 2022. India, 32,000 plus, was next followed by Germany at over 25,000, Brazil over 11,000, and the UK over 9,000. Given the small populations of Germany and the UK, these numbers are relatively high. Still, it's probably nothing compared to how many data requests the Chinese government makes from China's answer to Google, Baidu. Big tech firms in China have no choice but to share data with the government. 
Some of those big companies are Alibaba, Baidu, ByteDance, and Tencent. Under the Chinese cybersecurity law introduced in 2016, the Chinese government made it legal to conduct checks on any tech company's data anytime it wanted, all in the name of national security. To give you an example of how strict the government is, China's cyber administration ordered ByteDance to close a popular social media platform not long ago because it said some of the jokes and conversations amounted to improper public opinion. Not hate speech, just speech the government didn't like. Can you imagine Twitter being shut down for allowing improper public opinion? Actually, there's a story here, but we'll return to this controversial matter at the end. Article 28 of the Chinese cybersecurity law states, Network operators shall provide technical support and assistance to public security organs and national security organs that are safeguarding national security and investigating criminal activities in accordance with the law. It basically means when we come a knocking, you have to open the door. When someone says something the government finds distasteful, the companies, by law, have to give up that person if there is a request. Big Brother is watching you in China more than other countries, which is why China has been described as a giant panopticon. The Panopticon was a prison concept created by Jeremy Bentham, the British philosopher behind utilitarianism. If Bentham could see the world in action today, he'd look at China and probably think, yep, that's the way to do it. His theory was that if people understand they're being watched all the time, they'll be motivated to do the right thing. Chinese people know that they're being watched, it's taken for granted, so the theory goes that because they assume they're being watched, they will police themselves. In countries such as the US and UK, people kind of assume they have some privacy, not so much in China. China's Great Firewall blocks various internet sites and ensures lots and lots of information isn't even searchable. There is constant government monitoring of what people look at and post online. There are all those CCTV cameras too, but there's also facial recognition technology. China is leading the way in this field. The US has developed some very advanced facial recognition tech too. Still, we'll show you later Americans have been fighting back in regard to their faces being scanned. The Chinese government tells the Chinese people that facial recognition is beneficial to them. Some people agree, but this is controversial at the moment. A recent survey by a Beijing research institute revealed 74% of respondents said they'd rather have traditional ways of identifying people than tech scanning them everywhere they went. Even though 57% of people in the study said they were concerned about such tech, 60-70% to 70 agreed that it leads to less crime. That's because when a criminal is caught using facial recognition, the public often hears about the good news on TV. When a heroin dealer was arrested in the city of Zhengzhou not long ago, the news said the cops spotted the dealer with their new facial recognition glasses. They scanned the guy in the street, the facial recognition got to work, and the dealer was subsequently arrested. The deputy chief of police told the media, in the past it was all about instinct, if you miss something you missed it. Chinese citizens might have heard that on TV and thought facial recognition is indeed for the public good, although some of them might not have thought about the implications you're going to hear about later. In another case, over 20 people were arrested at a beer festival in Qingdao. CCTV powered with AI was the reason they were caught. Their faces were in a database and when the cameras picked them up, the cops were alerted. In Wuhu, cops arrested a guy who was on a murder charge after CCTV saw him buying some dinner from a small food stand. In a study on facial recognition, China was said to be the leader of the world when it comes to countries currently employing it. Russia was second, the United Arab Emirates was third, next in order were Japan, India, China, Brazil, Australia, France, Hungary, Malaysia, the UK, Argentina, the US, and then Mexico. China was easily at the top. That's partly because facial recognition is being used to shame people, not just arrest them. In Suzhou, if people left their home in their pajamas, facial recognition picked them up and then they appeared on the city's WeChat account. This wasn't against the law, but it was supposed to make them think twice about leaving the house not properly dressed. The program was supposed to expose uncivilized behaviors and improve citizens' quality, but the city later admitted that it went too far and apologized. They wrote, We wanted to put an end to uncivilized behavior, but of course we should protect residents' privacy. A park in one city used the technology to stop people from stealing toilet paper. Some schools have also tried that out. It was employed to spot kids who weren't paying attention in class. So yes, facial recognition tech is now everywhere in China. But today we're talking about social credit, a person's citizen score. Facial recognition is helping with this. As we just told you, sometimes the people in the wrong appear online or have their picture printed somewhere. There are many reports of walls of shame hearkening back to the days of Chairman Mao's cultural revolution. In 2018, it was reported that in Anhui, there were giant billboards featuring the names and faces of people who hadn't paid their debts. According to South China Morning Post, 
there were 10.5 million people who were publicly listed in China for being in debt. To address the problem of debt, the People's Court of Heizhong County in southwest China's Sichuan province showed moviegoers trailers in the theater featuring debtors. Can you imagine that? Sitting down with some popcorn to watch Fast and the Furious 25 and you star in the trailers. This is what social credit scores are sometimes about, shaming people so they'll do the right thing. It really is the digital panopticon. It works, too. Or at least it has worked in some of the stories we read while doing research for the show. At a busy intersection in the city of Xiangyang, jaywalkers and fast drivers used to cause chaos. So the city used CCTV cameras with facial recognition cameras and installed a giant screen. Soon lawbreakers' faces appeared on the screen with their names and other details. This was not just about fining people, it was about shaming them. Jaywalking rates soon decreased, but was all that spying a good thing? Some people thought so, especially when they heard bicycle thefts also decreased in some cities. Ask a Brit about bicycle theft. In the UK, they'll say, if it's not nailed down, someone will take it. But would they want China's kind of surveillance? We'll come back to that at the end. This all still sounds very dystopian, like something from an episode of Black Mirror. It sounds like a life where you might constantly be trying to do good things to accrue more points for more freedom and benefits. It also sounds like George Orwell's book 1984, which is where we get the Big Brother concept from. That's how the Western press has generally painted China's social credit system. But the Western press has sometimes been known for spreading anti-Chinese propaganda. The Diplomat in 2023 said, anti-China rhetoric is off the charts in the Western media, calling it hysteria and bias. It is true on any given day you can find a certain hysteria regarding China and how awful it is. Sometimes the criticism is definitely warranted, but the many social credit system articles in the media were and are, in fact, wildly exaggerated. To give you an example, in 2018, Vice President Mike Pence said, By 2020, China's rulers aim to implement an Orwellian system premised on controlling virtually every facet of human life, the so-called social credit score. In the words of that program's official blueprint, it will allow the trustworthy to roam everywhere under heaven while making it hard for the discredited to take a single step. While China's surveillance is shocking, nothing like the dystopian reality many viewers have discussed is true. No one in China has ever been barred from the cinema at 20 for kicking a dog in high school. There has never been a national database full of people's scores. People are not watched all day, all night, so they'll always do the right thing. You won't get penalized because you decided to read books by George Orwell. The social credit system was never about controlling every facet of human life. The system was set up in various Chinese cities, that much is true, but it was mostly about getting people to pay their debts or about folks being a public nuisance and doing things like stealing bicycles. What the Western press usually left out was that the cities testing it often asked people to volunteer for the scheme. In fact, in many places, the system was there to expose public officials who'd been corrupt. In other cases, you could receive a bad score for not paying your debts, and while you might appear on a national database, this wasn't much different from the credit scores you get in most Western nations. Rather than this being something the Chinese people were worried about all the time, most folks never gave it a second thought if indeed they knew such a system existed in their city. It was an experiment in most places, often only involving businesses. For instance, if a business kept ripping people off or selling dodgy equipment, it might appear on a list. Some people, of course, appreciated this. That's not what we heard, though. A spokesperson for the U.S. National Broadband Task Force for the FCC under Obama said that this would be the end of freedom in China, explaining China would not only become a totalitarian police state that monitors its people, but one that completely evades users' privacy. He added all forms of activity and interactions, online or otherwise, will be rated, available to view and stored as data. Such words sparked outrage and fear. There were subsequent discussions in the US with people saying just because you play many hours of video games doesn't mean you're idle, and just because you don't have kids doesn't mean you're irresponsible. Some people said there's nothing wrong with having a beer after a hard day's graft. Not all keep fit fanatics are good people, said others. For God's sake, Ted Bundy worked on a hotline for vulnerable women after working out in the gym. But none of these conversations were relevant to anything. China wasn't trying to score people's lives to put them in the good or bad camp. As the fear in the West was spreading like the Black Death, Chinese people might have read Western media and thought, what in Confucius's name are they talking about over there? Sure, Chinese people or most Chinese people know they live with a lot of surveillance. Some of them have protested against it in the street, just as surveillance technology was trying to track their masked faces. When some people protested against China's pandemic policies, facial recognition recognized them and soon the cops were at their door. 
Nonetheless, Chinese people would probably still look at you with a funny expression on their face if you asked them what their entire life social credit score was or if you told them to go easy on the beer lest they get denied entrance to the panda enclosure at the local zoo. The main point of the system in most places where it was trialed was to cut down on corruption and business fraud rather than prevent children from seeing pandas at the zoo because their father played League of Legends for eight hours straight. People know they're surveilled, make no mistake, but the 1984 reality that was portrayed in some parts of the Western media was unknown to many Chinese citizens. A senior research fellow at Yale Law School's Paul Tsai China Center in Beijing explained to Wired, the system as it exists today is more of a patchwork of regional pilots and experimental projects with few indications about what could be implemented at a national scale. I really think you would find a much larger percentage of Americans are aware of Chinese social credit than you would find Chinese people are aware of Chinese social credit. In many places, the schemes were more like loyalty reward programs. In other cities, if people had a good credit rating relating to their finances, they might later be trusted to defer paying some medical expenses. They were never about tracking or recording someone's entire life. As of 2022, it's thought there were 62 such systems in towns and cities throughout China. In many cases, people chose to take part because they wanted the rewards. People would gain points and get a free health checkup or a discount on a bike hire, or they could get fast-tracked for a visa application. In the experiment so far, in some cities at least, only between 1.5 and 15% of residents agreed to take part. They were also told their score only worked in that city, since other cities often use different systems. There have been blacklists and red lists for businesses, with the businesses on the red lists being the ones that haven't breached any industry regulations. These regulations were already there in Chinese law, but now there was a website where people could find businesses that had violated the regulations and ones that hadn't. So the point system was there to help people find a business they could trust. In other cases, you could end up on the list if you didn't pay a fine. This does indeed sound a bit dystopian, but it's still not quite Black Mirror-esque. If people were on a court's blacklist, they might not have been able to buy a high-speed train ticket. There are reports of parents not paying their debts, ending up on a blacklist, and their children being denied entrance to a school or a university. There was the case in which a guy's children were not allowed to enter a certain school because of his debts. Then he paid them and the kids were good to go. In another case that will resonate with Americans, especially New Yorkers, Beijing introduced a point system for its rapid transit system. You could lose points for being a nuisance on the train, such as eating, blasting music, drunkenness, smoking electronic cigarettes, acting threatening, or anything along those lines. Breaking the law was breaking the law, but smaller acts of misbehavior meant bad social credit. In the city of Guangzhou, the local government said you could appear on a blacklist system if you didn't pay your bills, insurance, taxes, or utility fees. The scheme also made it so that if young people cheated on their exams, they could end up in the database. A local government announcement explained, the public credit information of natural persons cannot be seen by everyone and can be queried at will, but can be disclosed through inquiries and the sharing of government affairs and is generally not publicized. In a case we mentioned at the start, one city thought about a law concerning pets. That's because the city had problems with people abandoning their dogs and cats when they became bored with them. So in the proposal, a man said, let's dock them points for doing that. It didn't mean they'd go to jail, but they might find out something became unavailable to them. Reports state that the Chinese government has prevented over 20 million people from buying plane tickets because they're on a blacklist for the things we've described. To most Westerners, this might sound nightmarish and for a good reason, but the social credit system still wasn't as bad as reported. That doesn't mean it's not oppressive, though. The surveillance in China to most Americans does seem horrific, given that Americans value their privacy and independence arguably more than other countries' citizens. The US came second after Israel in a world population review study of the most individualistic countries. In another study, the US came in first, followed by Australia and the UK. China ranked near the bottom. Americans might not like it if the US government awarded people points for eating healthy so as to cut down on obesity, one of the US's most costly and deadly issues. For most Americans, that's way too much government in their lives. The UK government has actually mulled over a privacy-busting app to fight the obesity crisis. This was indeed a kind of social credit scheme. People would be awarded points for eating the right foods. Remember, people these days pay for things using their phones, so it's easy to track what they eat. In 2021, the gov.uk website wrote, Pilot scheme will motivate people to make healthy changes to their lifestyle. It added the government is committed to helping people lead healthier, happier lives by making it easier for people to make healthy choices. You can't argue that people need to eat better to live better lives, on average anyway. Still, the age-old question arises, how much government do people need in their lives? 
Some people argue that Britain, remember a country where you're almost always on CCTV, could be the next country to initiate some kind of social credit system. In 2021, the Spectator newspaper wrote, We need to act now to block Britain's social credit system. This was mostly about the pandemic and vaccine passports, but the article added, The government is planning to introduce a health app in January which will monitor our shopping, our exercise levels, our intake of fruit and vegetables, and reward us with virtue points which we can exchange for discounts, free tickets, and other goodies. Virtue points, said the article, sounds a lot like China. China is leading the way in surveillance, but are other countries trying to catch up? The UK just introduced a highly controversial police act that'll make it harder to protest. There are recent reports of people being arrested for what Orwell would have called a thought crime. Police arrested people for embracing their freedom of expression online. While these instances might have offended someone, they only involved citizens airing opinions. The cops called these non-crime hate incidents. Critics pointed out that this was quite an Orwellian expression. People were contacted and put on the blacklist because of the possibility of committing a crime in the future. Over in the US, the Twitter files showed the government agencies were able to tell Twitter executives to shadow ban or block stories they thought were dangerous misinformation. Turned out to be true, and in fact, never even looked like misinformation to a discerning eye. This was very much in-your-face censorship, said many people. It was the government shaping narratives, they said. It turned out people were being watched for what they said and put on blacklists even if they had a very valid opinion. This is absolutely normal in China, but not in America. Some people or groups in the West worry about being blocked from using financial transaction systems. A free speech advocate writing in The Hill said, This could create a system in which individuals who do not hold certain political views could be blocked from polite society and left unable to make a living. If people fear not being able to get money, will they stay in line and say the right thing? This is why some people worry about such things as the digital dollar similar to China's digital yuan. Many Westerners fear all currency going digital in case they're frozen out of their money. 60% of transactions in China are already cashless, but other countries, including the US, are also much more cashless these days. What if PayPal locked you out, or a government threatened GoFundMe for no rational reason, and that prevented you from getting much needed funds? This is one of the reasons the American Civil Liberties Union said in 2019, say no to the cashless future and to cashless stores. A writer for CNBC called it a huge threat to our freedom because it'll permit governments to exercise incredibly powerful control over all human behavior. Statistics show that the Asia-Pacific region leads for the number of cashless transactions, followed by Europe and then North America. In terms of what people want, 77% of South Koreans said in a survey they prefer cashless. Sweden was next at 74, then came Russia, 72, UK, 70%, France at 67%, China at 67%, Spain at 61, Japan at 60, and the US at 58%. This was a big study featuring 676,000 people. In a Privacy HQ poll, 47% of Americans were actually for some kind of social credit system. 14% were neutral, 39% were against it. Gen Z was the most up for it. The older people were the least in favor, with the middle-aged in the middle. Uber and Airbnb already have such a system. Social media sites also sometimes have a strike system. So in some ways, we already have a social credit system. Still, in that poll, lots of people said they feared the loss of freedom to speak, too much government control and bias in the system. People worry about living in a world where they're watched and recorded at all times, where their faces are analyzed by AI, perhaps while protesting about controversial government measures. You need top-class facial recognition to do this. Studies show in 2008, China wasn't really selling its surveillance tech anywhere in the world. Now, over 80 nations have imported Chinese surveillance technology. Some cities in the US, including San Francisco, have banned the use of facial recognition by police. In the state of Illinois, the Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act prevents cops from scanning faces. Many people feel this way in the US. Some companies, such as Microsoft and Amazon, scaled back development after a public outcry. Many Americans are not too keen on going down the Chinese route of mass surveillance. Facial recognition and social credit scores might be coming, never mind what happens. If it can be shown it worked well at some point or another, especially where violent crime is concerned. Maybe some people will still say it's going too far and embrace what Confucius once said, cultivate the root, the leaves and branches will take care of themselves. Do we really need a panopticon? China's social credit system may not have been as bad as we were told, but it did point to a new reality in which people are watched all the time that they're out in public. Now you need to watch why China will never be a global superpower 
or have a look at Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a disaster for China.